Well, the field for 2024, it's beginning to take shape. On the GOP side, former President Donald Trump, of course, and Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, Asa Hutchinson, and Larry Elder have a begun, already begun their campaign. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, he filed his paperwork yesterday to run. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, well, he's expected to finally announce next week. All of these candidates are looking to take down President Biden, but who's going to do it? Well, we've got a great panel to discuss this and more. Let's bring in the beautiful Borellis to discuss today. Also joining me on the set here. Thank you so much, Thane, for being here with your beautiful luscious locks and hair. I love it. Um, he is a... <laughs> He is a distinguished professor at Toro University, accomplished author. Before I get to the Borelli's theme, we were discussing, you have a very interesting theory regarding Ron DeSantis and his path to success. Tell me about it. So Ron DeSantis needs to convince Republicans that Donald Trump will not prevail against Joe Biden. And so he needs to convince the Republicans that I understand that among Republicans, many of you favor Donald Trump, but Donald Trump can't win. I, on the other hand, watch, let's look at the Biden polling. His numbers are plummeting. He's nowhere. The Democrats are fearful, but they do appear to be, in the end, supporting him. Mm. I'm the only guy who can win the general election. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that, that Donald Trump against Do President Biden will be just a repeat of four years ago. But I will be able to recapture, galvanize the support of more de moderate Democrats who are tired of Joe Biden, perhaps think he's too old, do not like the progressive agenda that he's been pushing, would like a more moderate, and they will see me as more moderate than Donald Trump and his core supporters. Do you see more Democrats joining in? Well, we don't know that. There, there hasn't been a lot of polling on that. All the polling focuses on the plummeting Biden numbers. Mm -hmm. The polling should also be on, in given the polling numbers, that the poor numbers, could you be persuaded to vote for a Republican? Mm. And if you could be persuaded, who would you pick? And in that case, I think DeSantis can make the case that the polls will show more would pick him over Donald Trump. Very interesting theory there. Let's go over to, to Deneen, beauty, beauty before age. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> um, according to the latest Harvard-Harris poll, Trump has a massive lead in a hypothetical GOP primary, leading 58% compared to DeSantis at 16%. That is crazy right there. Vivek, 4%, Mike Pence, 4 Nikki Haley, others, not sure. Um, and then you have it there with a hypothetical uh, Trump versus Biden matchup, this Harvard, um, Har Harris Harvard poll, Trump 47%, Joe Biden uh, 40%. Uh, Deneen, do you think that the Durham report actually helps Trump case in the polls? Also, what do you think about the indictments? Because I think the Democrats were hoping that the indictments would be the nail in the coffin for, for President Trump. Well, sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure they did think that would be it. And they also have the uh, liberal media on their side to make those uh, make that trumpet of, a, of an announcement. Uh, but this is a marathon, as I see it right now, because there is still time for uh, the election. It's not a sprint. And we keep having more and more candidates come into the race. But if you're looking at it from a Biden-Trump perspective, I think Americans are seeing what a failed president Biden really is uh, with the economy, with inflation, uh, jobs. If you look at how he's uh, handling the debt ceiling, he's not concerned about it. Our foreign and national security, the border. So many things have gone so wrong under this president in a short period of time. And I think uh, Americans will take a second look if they did not support a Republican candidate previously. I have a lot of Democrat friends in New York City, and they, they tell me they're like, this is the best the Democrats can do, Joe Biden. I want you to take all take a look at Biden. He spoke earlier this morning on the status of the debt ceiling negotiations. Take a look. Before I left for this trip, I met with all four congressional leaders, and we agreed the only way to move forward was in a bipartisan agreement. <clears throat> and we've, I've done my part. We put forward a proposal to cut spending by more than a trillion dollars, and on top of the nearly $3 trillion in deficit reduction that I previously proposed through the combination of spending cuts and new revenues. What, new revenues, new taxes? Tom Borelli, what do you think about this? Well, certainly uh, 
President Biden over there in Japan is trying to negotiate with McCarthy on the world stage. And I don't think that's really the appropriate way to do it, in my view. I think this is a high stakes game of chicken, especially as the stock market opens up uh, tomorrow and there is no deal and they really haven't been talking yet. Uh, Biden also made the claim that some quote unquote MAGA Republicans would actually want to see a default. So that would tank the economy so Biden wouldn't be reelected. So Biden is engaging in high stage, uh, high risk politics. It has to play out. There's no excuse for this to be going so long and absolutely no excuse for this coming down to the last minute as Washington politics always leads that way. When that happens, the American people usually lose. You know, Thane, someone once said to me, they said, if you vote for Biden, you're basically voting for Kamala Harris because Biden's not going to make it. He's not because physically he's just not up to it. He's he's deteriorating quickly. What do you think about that? And then there's also talks that like Michelle Obama could come in and swoop it, swoop in. And it could be a Michelle Obama, Kamala Harris ticket, which that frightens me to my core. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> Lydia, that's why it's surprising that Democrats have not been able to convince the president that it's maybe time for you to step aside, that in the best interest of the party, your polling numbers and even your age, we love you, mm -hmm. but we think there might be some cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And in the best interest of the party, we need you to step aside in part because, President, you know Kamala Harris is not popular enough even among Democrats to carry the day. And it, what's even more interesting to me, given the fact, Lydia, that you mentioned Michelle Obama, the one person with influence over Joe Biden is Barack Obama. Mm. They were very loyal to each other. That was a very strong partnership. I think President Obama granted him the federal medal freedom. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. suspect, that in, in addition to saying, you know why my wife has a better shot than you, I'm surprised that, as you said, these are our choices that most Democrats are saying this is the best we can do. Right. And particularly since the numbers demonstrate that President Biden is not a strong contender for the next campaign. I don't think hey, he's Lydia, a strong contender just, to, to drive a car. Yes, Deneen, sure. If I could just mention, you uh, talked about Michelle Obama and Kamala Harris. That frightens me as well. <laughs> uh, but I... I really can't see Michelle jumping into the race. Look, she's got a pretty good right now, hanging out in Martha's Vineyard in her huge <laughs> house and traveling the world and in the country. And so I think it would be too much work for her to like just give all that up right now to run for president. That's just me. I know. She, she does have a nice cushy life there. Thank you so much, Deneen and Tom Borelli. And thank you so much, Thane Rosenbaum. We will be bringing you up again. All right, coming up, we return to Capitol Hill, where FBI whistleblowers were concerned that the FBI was retaliating against them for simply coming forward. What could this mean for the... I have been surviving on early withdrawals from our retirement accounts, while the FBI has ignored my request for approval to obtain outside employment during the review of my security clearance. We have lost our federal health insurance coverage, and there's apparently no end in sight. I'm hopeful scrutiny from Congress and from the Inspector General will deter the FBI from abusing the security clearance process to retaliate against others the way it's retaliated against me. And that's former FBI agent Marcus Allen alleging retaliation during the House Select Subcommittee hearing investigating the weaponization of the federal government. This happened on Thursday. Some stunning allegations were made. The panel examining whistleblower accounts alleging major abuses at the agency and how the FBI retaliated against them. Joining me now to, to discuss the legal ramifications regarding all of this is former federal prosecutor Joe Moreno. And back with us is our special guest, distinguished professor at Toro University, Thane Rosenbaum. Uh, Joe, I'll start off with you. These whistleblowers, they, they seem to have a, a, a legal defense against the FBI. From your experience as a prosecutor, how would you handle the FBI in terms of revealing what appears to be political bias? And there's even question as to whether they should be classified as whistleblowers, because if they are classified as whistleblowers, doesn't that grant them special status? Well, Lydia, this is going to come down to, I think, really two camps. One is the inspector general's office at the Department of Justice, and the other is Congress itself. And by the looks of that committee, I mean, these are three serious men, right? These are FBI employees, which is no small feat to get to the FBI. 
they are all mil military veterans. And I mean, I think at a minimum, they deserve to be heard. And it seemed very obvious to anyone watching, I think, that at least half that committee had zero interest in even hearing what they had to say. And so when the ranking member on the Democrat side starts out before even a word from a witness is spoken and says, this is a waste of time, that is not very encouraging that members of Congress are interested in getting to the bottom of this. And so I hope the inspector general's office takes this a lot more seriously. And I applaud those in Congress that are at least saying, look, let's hear these guys out and see what they have to say. Absolutely. And I, I'm hearing a lot of people think, talking about, well, they're whistleblowers. Can't they file a lawsuit? Whistleblower status, this and that. But then you even have the mainstream media and, of course, the Democrats saying they're not whistleblowers. They had their clearance revoked. They're just disgruntled employees. Why is it so important that they be assigned the whistleblower status? And what could they do going forward as far as filing a lawsuit? It's always much more difficult, Lydia, suing the government, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the FBI has covered its tracks. They've done what most employers are doing in this situation. And of course, they have the advantage of being in the government. So when they say, when we fire someone and we have a national security reason for doing so, don't second guess us. We're not some, you know, mom and pop store. We're the FBI. And we're telling the American people that these men have violated ethical principles mm. of their employment contracts. So I think it's very difficult in this instance for them, even if they have that status, mm. to receive that kind of uh, protection. But I think that when you think about Congress, you know, half the committee not caring, you know, it's ironic because it fit, falls right out of the Durham report, because the Durham report basically said, you didn't want to do the job of investigating, even though there's FBI stands for investigation. Mm. You didn't want to investigate. You just went with your own confirmation biases. The, the Durham report is very indicting. It says things like, ouch. Mm -hmm. It says things like, the FBI did not use the analytical tools that it right. has at its disposal. It, it lacked analytical rigor. Mm -hmm. You know how embarrassing that is? And I know mainstream medium doesn't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But the FBI should never be accused of not using its analytical tools and lacking analytical rigor and being succumbing entirely to confirmation bias, which means it's worse than political bias. It means that right. I just don't want Donald President Trump to be president. I don't want the people from January 6th to be treated favorably. And that's where I'm going. Right. And I'll find, I'll say anything I need to say and, and write down anything I need to write down to get that result. Right, because it was just completely politically motivated. Joe, last question to you. Uh, we're, we're, what happens to Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI? How, how does he maintain his job? How does he keep his job? That Durham report, as you just heard Thane say, we read through it too, it's very extensive. It is, it is damning to the FBI. That's right, Lydia. Well, look, I mean, the, the people that were most directly involved are largely gone, right? So James Comey, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, they're all out of the bureau. Chris Wray can legitimately say he came in when most of this had already either happened or was in the process of happening. However, he is in the unique position to actually look at the situation now that we have the benefit of time and analysis and say, how can we do better? And I think that's where he succeeds or fails. How do you, res how do you restore that sense of confidence in the FBI among the American people that unfortunately has sorely been damaged this past week? Excellent point there. Joe Moreno, thank you so much. And Thane Rosenbaum, we will be speaking to you again. Still to come, no deal. We're inching closer to the potential June 1st debt ceiling deadline. That's my birthday. Ta talking a hit de taking a hit detour on Friday, but President Biden, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy have agreed to speak later today. But Kevin McCarthy tweeting last night that the Death, the talks have gone backwards. President Biden said they're moving forward. He's talking about revenues. We're going to break it down. Uh, Biden, he's uh, he's flying back home today from the G7 meetings in Japan. Let's bring in our our panel. It is Whitley Yates. Can we bring up the prompter, please? Whitley Yates and uh, Jason Nichols with us. Uh, Whitley Yates is a Project 21 member, publicist, political activist. Jason Nichols, senior lecturer, African-American studies, University of Maryland, College Park. 
and also our special guest, distinguished professor at Toro University, Thane Rosenbaum. He is back with us. So I'll start off with you, Jason. What do you think? Where do we go from here? You've got the Democrats blaming the Republicans. The Republicans, you know, saying the Democrats simply want to spend too much. So what happens? It seems like we're not going to make a deal before June 1st. Well, first of all, uh, if I don't talk to you on June 1st, happy birthday, Lydia. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, this is something that shouldn't be happening. And we know that even uh, former President Trump was clear that uh, we should not negotiate about paying our bills. Uh, this could cost us 8 million jobs. This could cost uh, a lot of people a lot of retirement savings. It could cost our veterans uh, their benefits and our, our elderly, their Social Security benefits. This is a real problem. Now, the sticking point that people are talking about is uh, work requirements for, for SNAP and Medicaid. Uh, there are already uh, work requirements for SNAP. Uh, we know you have to work 20 hours a week to get SNAP anyway, and the majority uh, of SNAP and Medicaid uh, recipients work. So this is really something that I think uh, Democrats and Republicans are finding a big chasm in between. I think the president uh, has put forth a budget that says that we're going to cut $3 trillion in a decade and we can raise new revenues uh, by taxing uh, the wealthy. And of course, I think Republicans are trying to put the onus on people who have less money, people who are trying to get food stamps and Medicaid. So mm -hmm. we're, we're really in a tough situation. I'm not sure that we're going to find uh, a relief other than if the president tries some unconventional means, which would be invoking the 14th Amendment. Whitley, your response Please. to that. No, I think this is completely asinine. Democrats have come up with no plan, but spin, spin, spin. And when the Republicans did come up with a plan, the president was against it. Not only was he against it, he had refused to meet. And so it's great that he's meeting now, but as we're seeing, the debt ceiling is looming. What needs to happen is that the country needs to go back to pre-pandemic spending levels because we're no longer in COVID and we need to reduce as much spending as possible so that we can cut inflation. I don't understand why this is such a hard thing to grasp or why the president is currently so against it. You know, uh, Thane Rosenbaum, President Biden, he ran as a moderate, but he is certainly is governing like the squad. I mean, you have Cori Bush asking for, for reparations. So that's the concern here. He just wants to spend, spend, spend as if he's uh, a progressive instead of the moderate that people thought they elected. That's precisely right, Lydia. That's why I remember what was happening in pre-pandemic spending levels. There was a Republican in the White House. So to return to that, we have to roll back in a completely different progressive agenda. Uh, uh, Biden ran as a moderate, has been governing as a progressive. He is beholden to the progressives on multiple levels. We've seen this throughout his presidency, whether it's the Green New Deal, you know, whether it's the endless repeatings of the words white supremacy, right? Mm. I mean, there's endless examples of a moderate who is, is saying the script, reciting the script of the progressives, and he's boxed in. In, in, in what he's essentially committing himself to do is to, to, to tax the rich and to put no ceiling. There is no ceiling mm -hmm. if you're talking about reparations, if you're talking about the Green New Deal. There's so many things that are in the, in the, uh, in the right. lineup of the progressive agenda. It, it really is, and it's just a, more money going out of our pockets. I mean, how much more? Uh, Whitley, and I'll ask you, Jason, both of you, we have two minutes left, so I'll get a minute from each of you. Whitley, what do you think about the president coming out and saying that the greatest threat facing our nation is white supremacy and not the border crisis, not the fentanyl crisis, not the inflation or the debt ceiling or anything like that? It's white supremacy. I think it's a progressive talking point, and I personally think that President Biden is out of touch with the American people and kitchen table issues that everyone is worried about. We're worried about inflation, we're worried about the cost of our food, we're worried about the cost of gas, and all of these different things that are touching us each and every day. I think that his head is so far up the progressive's agenda that he cannot see what the American people actually need. And Jason, your rebuttal, what do you think? Well, the president has put forth a budget that deals with kitchen table issues. And if you're really interested in the economy, then really what you should do is raise the debt limit, as we've done every time since uh, 1960. And we did three times under President Trump. So I, I would definitely say that that's not the case. As far as a terror threat, domestic terror threat, that's what the FBI says. That's what the DOJ says. So he is saying what the experts are saying about 
uh, the terror threats within our country. And we've seen it over and over, whether it's Buffalo, where people that look like me oh. and Whitney were oh, targeted on. over and we, over. You there. cannot say, you can't no, just point to like a single like isolated incident. And we know how politicized the DOJ and the FBI are. So you, can, you have to admit, Jason, it is 100% this progressive talking point. He's pandering. And the fact, I mean, I thought I would be offended as a, uh, that he was saying this at a historically black college to say like, oh, that's all they care about. These are really smart, educated people with these amazing degrees. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, get, be, be afraid. Be very afraid of the boogeyman, the white supremacist. You know, I'm not saying there's not white supremacy, but it's certainly not the greatest threat facing our nation. So if, if I can respond really quickly, what I'll say is that your other guest just said he says it all the time. So apparently he's not just saying it to a black audience at a black college. Uh, the other thing is he was talking about terror threats. And when we look at terror threats up to this point and terror threats that the DOJ says will could come in the future, they come from white nationalists. So he's not he's telling like, people right. to be afraid. Wait, wait, I know you're dying because no, we're seeing no, 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 how many terrorists, no, 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 their potential terrorists, they're catching the crook coming across the border. About. On the what Joe Biden list. is not no, saying, the thing that he's not talking about, he's not talking about the immigration crisis that's hitting black communities, specifically in Chicago and in, in New York. He's not talking about how fentanyl is decimating our country. Yes. He's not talking about how he's attempting to restore the economy. There are so many things that he's not talking about, and the, the talking points that he is talking right, about guys. are... America. I love you, Willie. I love you, Jason Nichols. Thank you guys so much. And Thane Rosenbaum, we'll be talking to you again real soon. A real spirited conversation there. And that's what we're about here at Newsmax, getting everybody's side of the story. Up next, border agents, they're reeling from a post Title 42 America with tens of thousands of legal migrants seeking asylum in the United States. Millions at this point, not even. It's Is there any end in sight? And will the Biden administration continue to allow these illegals to come in? And of course, you are footing the bill for them. You're watching Sunday Agenda. The Hunter Biden investigation warning of dire consequences those details coming up plus the biden border crisis taking a strange turn when the department of homeland security goes against the federal judge's orders those details also coming up and president biden taking to the world stage at the g7 conference in hiroshima japan now has he been rep how has he been re representing the nation and will this uh, bring up memories of his last international trip will he even remember this one i don't know we shall see all right let's take a live look now at the u.s capitol this afternoon there it is very beautiful and majestic there and as we said off the top of the show chairman jim jordan and ohio representative mike turner they sent a letter to the CIA director, William Burns, requesting documents related to the Hunter Biden investigation. They warn Burns, quote, compulsory process may be necessary ooh, if the agency does not comply. So the federal government has been investigating Hunter Biden alleged tax possible dealings, not the not the laptop itself, but these texts since like, I think, what, 2017? It's been going on for years and we're still waiting for, for some sort of outcome. Let's welcome in Texas Representative Pat Fallon, who's on the House Oversight and Accounting uh, and Accountability Committee. Also with us, distinguished Toro College uh, University professor Thane Rosenbaum, and you're also a distinguished author. Uh, Representative Fallon, let's go over to you. In the letter sent to CIA Director Burns, uh, Representative Jordan and Burns, they both point out that the committees have received evidence that the CIA, or at least an employee of the CIA, may have helped to solicit signature, signatories, signatories for the statement <laughs> about Hunter Biden. Um, I don't want to keep reading more. I mean, the, the, it's just, it seems corruption at the highest level I mean, how much more do we have to wait? We've seen the laptop. We've seen the evidence. We've seen all. I mean, how much more evidence does there need to be for something to happen? Well, Lydia, you're absolutely right. Now we know as fact that those 51 folks that signed that letter, it was actually it was just a political hit ruse. Really, it wasn't true. It was completely false. And they did it because they wanted Joe Biden to have a bullet, if you will, in his <coughs> repertoire to <laughs> counter President Trump's claims about the Hunter Biden laptop. And uh, it was a Russian disinformation, which it clearly was not. In fact, the only Russian disinformation we have proven is the, uh, the or proven false, rather, was the fact that President Trump didn't have any collusion with Russia. 
So it was something that Anthony Blinken facilitated. And if it was an active federal employee that helped him, then, you know, people need to be fired and people need to be prosecuted. Thane, I'll turn it over to you. More allegations have come forward that the DOJ is now also interfering in the Hunter Biden tax probe. Americans keep saying, OK, it looks like there's a two tier justice system. We saw what happened to President Trump, Trump over classified documents. They raided Melania's underwear drawer. Look what they did to Barron. Look what they did to Rudy Giuliani, the FBI raid. They ended up dropping those charges against him. Yet Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, all the other family members were seeing all these transactions. Where is the raid? Clearly, it does appear that the highest levels of office have been politicized. And it's very dangerous, Lydia, because the American people lose faith in their institutions. They should believe that the law enforcement entities in this country and the Justice Department are neutral, mm -hmm. that they're not Democrats, even if they're appointed by Democrats. Right. Lady Justice has that blindfold on for a reason. Yeah. We're supposed to believe that these entities are working under the Constitution and to seek the truth. And so when we see, you know, two standards of justice, the Durham report, was a very good example. Uh, they gave a heads up to the Clinton administration, the FBI, mm -hmm. when they thought that there was some potential tampering. Mm -hmm. And with Donald Trump, they didn't give any heads up. They simply issued FISA warrants mm -hmm. to I illegally surveillance his uh, campaign team. That's just outrageous. Right. And the 51 uh, uh, intelligence chiefs that signed that letter, mm -hmm. imagine, remember, this is before the Durham report, the word Russian collusion was in everyone's mind, mm -hmm. right? Russian misinformation. So this is before the election. The minute it's like lighting fire, mm -hmm. the minute you say this Hunter Biden story mm -hmm. is nothing but Russian in, uh, misinformation, Russian collusion, it's another example of Trump invading his power with the Russians. No wonder. Right? You only sign a letter like that mm -hmm. if you're trying to stop something or if you're trying to endorse something. And those 51 intelligence chiefs wanted to stop the Trump campaign and wanted to endorse Joe Biden. Representative Fallon, last question to you. What do you think should happen to those 51 intelligence officials? They all still have their security clearance. It's just outrageous to me. No, I think their security clearances clearly should be pulled. They signed that letter, It was, and they were using their official titles, which was also very disingenuous. And, uh, you know, they're supposed to be, federal employees are supposed to be acting as referees, if you will, and not choosing sides. I don't want my military politicized. I don't want my FBI politicized, but unfortunately, that's what's happened. But if there's no consequences, it's not going to stop. So at least those 51 former members should have their uh, security clearances pulled and can you imagine if this was in the reverse, if this was Republicans that had done that, if it was President Trump that had done it, CNN, MSNBC and the other, uh, you know, liberal alphabets would have gone crazy. Their hair would have been on fire. But again, it's a two tiered system and it's very unjust. All right. Well, thank you so much, Representative Pat Fallon. And thank you so much, Thane Rosenbaum. We'll be talking to you again. Coming up, Biden's broken borders. By now, you've heard Title 42. It's expired. Uh, but was it ever being enforced to begin with? We're seeing millions of migrants, illegal migrants, flowing into our country. But did you know that border agents are seeing an increase of Chinese migrants as well? We'll be discussing next on Sunday Agenda. Great vindication, and it feels good. And the report has been, you know, wildly praised. It, I wish it could have come faster, but... The detail that he went into, 308 pages, the detail is extraordinary. And uh, all of these people, it's, I guess you could call it treason, you could call it a lot of different things. But this should never be allowed to happen in our country again. And that was President Trump with Rob Schmidt, and it certainly did take way too long. Several years and more than 300 pages later, the long-awaited report on the FBI's probe into the ties between Russia and President Trump. I mean, it turns out to be one big hoax, just like Trump said. Joining me now to break this all down is New Jersey Congressman and member of the House Judiciary Committee, Jeff Van Drew. Also with us is our special guest, distinguished professor at Toro University, Thane Rosenbaum. Uh, let's go to you, Congressman. According to the report, Durham found that the FBI allegedly acted too hastily. 
and relied on raw and unconfirmed intelligence when it opened the investigation. Durham also stated in part, quote, the DOJ and FBI failed to uphold their important mission of strict fidelity of the law. Uh, what goes through your mind when when you hear something like this? I mean, this is the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. I mean, and, and for this kind of corruption to be there, add that with the whistleblowers, what they're alleging, what should happen to the FBI at this point? Oh, the FBI has to be restructured at the top. It has to be gutted and restructured so it does the job it was supposed to do. And that job is simple and in, in, in its essence is to protect the American people and to protect the American government. And here we are, we find that they're not doing that. We need protection from the FBI and the CIA and the Department of Justice for the American people and for our great country. So that really needs to be some serious change. They have to be depoliticized, defanged. And I don't mean when they're going after bad guys, because that's what they should be doing. But when they're doing political type of activity such as this and weaponizing it uh, is just awful. And the same people are still there, some of them. And worse than that, we have people in Congress who really push this. We have people in the media who push this. Pulitzer Prizes were given out when all this stuff was being done, and it was all lies. Everything President Trump said was true. People may not like that. You may not like President Trump, but the reality is, I do, but the reality is that he just told it how it was. And now we have right. finally, inclusively found out whether Adam Schiff likes it or not. It's just really incredible, Adam Schiff uh, and Nancy Pelosi, how they just blatantly lie to the American people. We we now know from this, this report and the fact that the mainstream media is even kind of giving no credence to the Durham report either. Uh, what what do you think is what should happen to the FBI thing? Well, you know, this this allegation that the, <clears throat> they were guided by confirmation bias is really dangerous, right? Because this is what the founding fathers were worried about. Mm -hmm. They wanted elective representatives. They did not want elite administrators making decisions. Confirmation bias means we have a direction and a truth that we want, and we will find and pick and choose anything to confirm our bias, which is worse than political bias. They're just saying, and so therefore they are giving themselves the level of authority that we wouldn't give an elected re representative. So this is what the allegation is with respect to the FBI, with respect to political leadership, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they represented in front of the entire nation that they had actually seen evidence when in fact the evidence was not there for, of collusion, mm -hmm. that the FBI did not have probable cause. You know, basic stuff, first day of law school, Right. FBI doesn't have probable cause. And yet they were off to the races. Mm -hmm. And it was it wasn't entirely the Steele dossier as the opposition research on behalf of Hillary Clinton. But that was part of it. But that, that they simply never had enough evidence to put this country through the level of ultimately the investigation that became the Mueller report. And mm -hmm. that is just very scary because it's the essence of against what representative democracy means. Turning to uh, Hunter Biden, Congressman, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan and Mike Turner, they sent a letter to the CIA director, Williams Burns, for answers on the Hunter Biden intelligence and the 51 intelligence uh, community officials that signed off on the bogus letter. Uh, this comes as the DOJ even removed its entire IRS team from looking into Hunter's tax fraud case. Congressman, how are Republicans in your committee responding? I mean, uh, I'm sure the American people, they're sitting out there and they're like, what? How could this be happening? How could there not be any repercussions? We've seen the videos. We know that they lied. And yet nothing seems to be happening. Are these committees actually effective? They are. We're doing everything we can. You have to keep one thing in mind, that we have a thin majority in Congress uh, in the House of Representatives, which we do. The Senate isn't doing much of anything. And of course, the president doesn't cooperate at all. So there's a, a, a certain amount we can do and we're doing it. There's nobody more proactive that I know than Jim Jordan. I'm working on his right hand side there to do everything that we possibly can. We're asking to get the documents. We're asking 
asking to get the information. Uh, you know, it was unbelievable. They were pushing, the other side was pushing the DOJ to go after the poor guy that owned the computer store. I mean, this is a world in which we live in now, this political governmental world. We're telling the truth is something that just doesn't occur. And we're going to have to fight hard, and it's not going to be easy. And sometimes you even get punished for telling the truth. It's but incredible. the bottom line is Hunter Biden did do all those things. He does have that information on the computer. They have received money, not only Hunter, not only the president, not only multiple members in these fake corporations that they have. They've all received money from companies in communist China and from the communist Chinese, and they won't let the information out. Even the IRS knows it. So we have good Americans. Just think of this is heartbreaking. Good Americans, whether they're in the FBI, whether they're in the IRS, whether they're in the Department of Justice that are trying to push the information out and they're punished for that. Mm. They get punished for it. You heard what they said when those FBI agents were on and they were speaking about what was happening to them right. because they were telling the truth and because they were whistleblowers. We're fighting for America here. By the way, worse than Watergate. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. Mm. This is far worse than the Watergate. This goes to the foundation of our nation. Thank you so much, Congressman Jeff Van Drew, and thank you, Thane Rosenbaum, for being with us. Coming up, 27 years ago, Roger Ailes built the Fox News media empire where conservatives have had a voice. They had a voice, had. But today, the Murdochs are running Roger Ailes' vision right into the ground. You are going to be hearing from Roger Ailes' widow, Elizabeth Ailes, in a stunning interview with Eric Bowling. She discusses the downfall of Fox News and the destruction of her husband's dream. That, that report, that interview, next. Five Republican candidates, including former President Trump, have already begun their campaigns ahead of 2024. And by the end of next week, we may have even more candidates joining in, one of whom is expected to be Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He's been acting like he's running for president. Let's see if he makes it official. He is sparking a lot of change in the freedom state of Florida, and he had a great show showing in the polls to earn his second term as governor. That's one poll. Other polls show him being handedly defeated by Trump. So does DeSantis stand a chance against Trump? Joining me now to discuss is policy analyst Donna Jackson. And also with us is Florida businessman and GOP strategist Ford O'Connell, along with our special guest, distinguished professor at Toro University, Thane Rosenbaum. Thank you all for being with us. Ford, let's start off with you. We certainly got a clue from DeSantis on Friday that it looks like he's really ready to enter the race for president, officially, that is. Take a look. I think you can do it all. I think it's just making sure you have a, a strong agenda and, and people see that you're in it uh, for the right reason. So not going to be easy. Uh, but I honestly believe that uh, that we have an opportunity to right the ship uh, and to get this whole country going in a much better direction. But the latest Harvard Harris poll, it doesn't seem to give Governor DeSantis, DeSantis much of a shot. Ford, what do you think? Well, Trump is firing on all cylinders. He's running circles around the DeSantis campaign. He's leading DeSantis by 30 to 40 points nationally. I think the big thing here is back home in my home state of Florida, Trump is leading DeSantis in the primary there as well. And when DeSantis' calling card is Florida for 2024, it doesn't look good when Donald Trump is mastering you in your own backyard. DeSantis really has a very narrow window to win this. And for him to win it, he'd have to win the Iowa caucus to even have a strong showing. Donna, I mean, it seems certainly um, more Floridians, though they are they are backing Trump. A poll conducted by Florida Atlantic University and Main Street Research shows 69 percent of registered GOP Florida voters say they want Trump back in office. Uh, what do you think about that? There's also well, that well, talk that DeSantis uh, doesn't have much of a personality and some of the billionaire donors are kind of a little apprehensive about giving him their money. Well, DeSantis needs uh, people to endorse him to show that he can do the job. But Trump only needs to have more enemies. Despite the, co the conglomerate of the Biden administration, intelligence community, mainstream media, even the uh, establishment Republicans, none of these people prove that alone or together they can defeat Trump. Trump is the most powerful man in this race because all of those people need to 
band together and they still can't defeat him. Mm. Thane, what do you think? Uh, does DeSantis stand a chance? You have an interesting theory. Well, this really is a stand, tests the standing and the staying power of Donald Trump, right? Imagine this. Uh, DeSantis managed the pandemic better than any other governor. Mm -hmm. He's young. He's telegenic. He's Ivy League educated. He served in the military. Mm -hmm. There's no porn star situation. Mm. He's getting hammered in the polls, right? You would think that given how controversial the Trump administration has been, mm -hmm. that there would be more Republicans that would be, especially in his own state, that would rally around DeSantis. So I think this is a surprising outcome. Things can always change. But really, when you think about what Donald Trump said in the original debate in 2016, my core supporters don't care what I do. I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. Donald Trump time and time again has been right. Mm -hmm. His core report supporters will not abandon him. Right. And he's felt confident about it, and he has obviously good reason to feel strongly that they're going to show up. And we've seen a lot of the persecutions and indictments against Trump. They have 100% been politically motivated. Even the porn star Stormy Daniels, she actually owes him money when it, when it comes to all the cases and everything like that. And let's not even get into the D.A. Bragg case, and we can go on and on. We only have about two minutes left, so I'll toss it over to both Donna and Ford, but I'll start off with you, Ford, first. What, what do you think? What, what, what happens next? Do you think they'll be, you know, do you think this will galvanize uh, Trump? Do you think his campaign will continue rising? Because I, I, I don't see it stopping. You know, I think you're absolutely right, Lydia. Trump is getting stronger by the day. And to Thane's point, here's what's happening. It's not just core Trump supporters. Trump is gaining strength among Republican primary voters because every lie told about Donald Trump has not been true, from the Durham report to the 51 spies who lied. And now if you actually look at general election polls, even independents are getting on board with Donald Trump because he is now leading Joe Biden in the real clear politics average of polls by 1.4 points. And that is only increasing by the day. And Donna, what do you think? You think uh, he keeps going up and up in those polls? Absolutely. I can tell you right now, black voters love Trump because they he's a fighter and they see him as someone that will be on their side through thick and through thin. Mm. Thank you so much, Donna Jackson, Ford O'Connell. Donna, can I say you look beautiful? You just look stunning. <laughs> look at that. You look beautiful. Am I allowed to say that? I'm going to get in trouble now. Thane Rosenbaum, thank you so much. And you're a beautiful man yourself. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody, after the break on Sunday Report with President Biden's approval number.